The legendary Nikon D700. Is its great reputation deserved? Continue watching for my opinion. So this is not going to be a review of the D700. There have been a ton of reviews on this camera ever since it was introduced in 2008. One review I especially recommend is the one on DP Review. It was published in October of 2008, and it's very thorough, goes into all the features of the camera, all the specifications. So in this video, I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just going to give you my opinion of the camera. Um, this is not my camera. This is my son's camera, and let me just explain. He got into photography a few years ago, and uh, he bought a Nikon Z50. But he is one to read a lot, to look at a lot of videos, and he was hearing a lot of good things, reading a lot of good things about the D700. And a couple of years ago, uh, he had helped me a lot on a lot of jobs and wanted to get him something really nice for Christmas. So I said, you know, what camera would you like? I want to get you a camera, a used camera. And um, he said a D700. So we got it for him and he loves it. In fact, he uses this D700 more than he does his Z50. So uh, when this camera was introduced, I was actually shooting with a Nikon D300. Let me just explain just a little bit. I previously had a D200. The D300 was introduced around the same time as the D3, and the D3 was Nikon's first full-frame digital camera. The D300 was a crop camera. And then about six months, I guess, after I got the D300, the D700 came out. Now, and I really couldn't afford it at the time, and I was pleased with the D300 for what I did. So the D700 was Nikon's second full-frame mirrorless camera. Uh, some people considered it the baby D3. Basically, similar sensor, uh, excellent low light capability, excellent, very low, high ISO noise. That was like the, the big feature, the thing everybody was talking about when that camera was introduced. And through the years, its reputation has grown. So why? I think one of the reasons was it was a much less expensive camera than the D3. It had that excellent high ISO, whereas the D300 was okay, but it was a crop sensor camera and usually a full frame camera is going to have better high ISO. And recently I did a video comparing the D700 to my Z8. And I will put a link in the description below to that video. In that video, I compared the high ISO of each camera. And the 15, 16 year old D700 was very close to the one-year-old Z8. So look at that video, and it is pretty amazing that a camera 15, 16, I guess it's 16 years old now, could perform so well at high ISO. And that was shooting RAW and converting to JPEG in Lightroom. JPEGs out of the camera are not as good as the more modern camera. So just shoot RAW and you'll be very pleased. This camera has a great reputation for color, excellent color. And we're gonna look at some pictures in a few minutes to illustrate some of these things. So just a little bit about some of the specifications on the camera. It has a default ISO from starting at 200 and going up to 6400. And those 6400 ISO images are very usable if you shoot RAW, process them through Lightroom. I'm sure other RAW converters will do a good job as well. It features Nikon's excellent 51-point autofocus system, similar to the one on the D3, the D810, the D850, 
works great. It has a frame rate of five frames per second. And if you add the optional grip, that brings it up to eight frames a second. So it's a decent sports camera. Not as good as today's mirrorless cameras, but it's very good. It does have live view. It doesn't have video capabilities. Actually, the first Nikon to have that was the uh, D90. But if you're not into video, I mean, this is an excellent camera for still photography. It's a 12 megapixel camera. And you may hear some people say, well, 12 megapixels isn't good enough. You know, today we have 45 and 60 megapixel cameras. 12 megapixels is good enough for most situations. Unless you intend to crop heavily, 12 megapixels is fine. It also has something that's rare on cameras today. It actually has a PC connection. So you could plug in a flash rather than having to use the hot shoe. So a lot of cameras today don't have that. It syncs with flash up to a 250th of a second. You could mount manual focus lenses. However, they must be either AI or AIS lenses, or even the Series E lenses, which are AIS lenses. You cannot mount, and this is very important, you cannot mount the older pre-AI lenses. If you do, you will damage the camera. If they were converted to AI, you're fine. Manual focusing is made easy by using the electronic rangefinder in the camera. You turn, it indicates in which direction to turn the focus ring to bring the lens into focus. When it is in focus, a green dot in the center lights up. So has a lot of features, like I said. I'm not gonna go into them all. So why don't we look at some pictures? Here's some pictures that I took at a family gathering at ISO 3200. Now this was a combination of window light and some incandescent room lights. I was using Tamron's 45 millimeter 1.8 lens that has image stabilization. Now the body, this camera does not have built-in image stabilization. Actually, no Nikon DSLRs do. The mirrorless cameras have that. I was seated on a couch taking these pictures and they were cropped heavily and very low noise. They were all converted from RAW in Lightroom. Now this camera, as I said earlier, has a very good reputation for excellent color. And uh, here's some images taken outside on that same day. By the way, these were all with auto white balance and it does a pretty good job with auto white balance unless you're in like really a dark room with incandescent lights. And uh, I think the modern cameras, the, the mirrorless cameras do a better job with that auto white balance in that situation. But uh, these images outside of some flowers were all shot with auto white balance you know, again, with that 45 millimeter Tamron lens and it works out, it worked out great. And here we have a few more images. These were at my home and uh, this image here taken of a um, leopard, a, a brass leopard in a window. And, you know, the light was all coming from one side. And uh, this was at uh, 1250 ISO. And you can see the dynamic range here that it really holds up well. Here's some images of the cat on a chair with, it was backlit with uh, window coming, th uh, light coming through a window. And again, I think it holds up really well. In all these images, the only thing I did was a little bit of exposure adjustment in Lightroom and maybe playing around with highlights and shadow a little bit. But uh, you could see that uh, noise does not increase when brightening the shadows. And this one image here uh, of the cat, this last image that we're gonna look at, uh, is a little bit of blown highlight to the left of the cat's nose, if you notice. And uh, I really couldn't bring that back anymore. I, I think this camera does a really good job with dynamic range. So you could find these cameras for under $400, which I think is a bargain for such a, a great camera. This sold new for $3,000 back in 2008. 
Uh, if you're a landscape photographer and you don't mind spending a little bit more money, I would recommend the Nikon D810. You could pick up a D810 for six, seven hundred dollars. So you know you're looking at two, three, four hundred dollars more possibly. But it's a 36 megapixel camera. It's the default ISO goes from 64 as opposed to 200 for the D700, all the way up to 12,800. And noise is very similar between these two cameras. In fact, I think at high ISO, the D700 might be a little bit better when shooting raw and converting than the D810. But if you need to crop a lot, again, the higher megapixel count uh, camera will work better for you. For a landscape photographer who's printing big, who may need the maximum amount of dynamic range, you're going to get that with the DA-10, especially at that 64 ISO. One of the negatives of this camera is it's noisy. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fire off a shot here at 1 1 25th of a second. I'm going to hold it close to my microphone. Okay. And now I'm going to do the same thing at the same shutter speed with my DA-10. So you could hear that the DA-10 is quieter than the D700. Uh, it's not a huge difference, but it's definitely a difference. And of course, a mirrorless camera can be totally silent. So to answer the question I posed at the start of this video, is the D700 deserving of its reputation? And I will answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, it is. It's an excellent camera. It's been around for 16 years. It still produces great images, and you can get it very inexpensively at under $400 for one in really good condition. It's a little on the heavy side, but it's extremely well made, and I highly recommend it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And as always, if you have any questions or comments on this video, please leave them in the comments below. I always try to respond to all questions and comments. I usually publish a new video every Monday morning and Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So I will talk to you next time.